Rome. The mid-300s BCE. It's been about 30 years since Brennus and the Gauls sacked the city. Over three decades of rebuilding, reconstructing, and reflection. During this time, the Romans even elected their first consul from the plebeian class. While the internal politics of Rome churned on, the next half-century was marked more by their foreign exploits. With the sack of their city still fresh in their minds, the Romans needed to keep their borders safe by expanding. And ironically, expanding one's borders just creates more border to protect, and more reason to have to expand even further. This would be a theme we see with the later Romans, but it began here. The closest foes to the Romans were the other Latin tribes around the city, but the Romans had already exerted their power over them, some as far back as when Rome was still a kingdom. To the south, Rome's influence ran until the Liri River, and a peace treaty kept them from going any further. On the other side of this river were the Samnites. They were not Latins like the Romans, but Oscan speakers, still all under the umbrella of the Italic speakers. Though quite superstitious, the Samnites were expert agriculturalists and pastoralists, and the mountainous terrain made them tough and rugged. Their army was no laughing matter either, as the Romans would soon learn. Livy, our source for much of this period, states that the Samnites attacked the city of Capua, in Campania, who then requested aid from the Romans. Most modern historians question this, and it's more likely Rome just needed an excuse to send in their military, and take Capua for themselves. Livy's account does seem awfully close to the Athenian story in the Peloponnesian War. In either case, the Romans crossed the Liri, breaking the Samnite Treaty, and marched into Campania and Samnium, in 343 BCE, beginning the first of three major wars. This first Samnite war ended in 341 BCE, and resulted in a stalemate with the Samnites, but Rome came out of it with Capua under their belt. Fresh off the Samnite war, the Romans had to deal with another problem almost immediately. Just a year later, in 340 BCE, the Latin tribes around Rome tried to regain their independence, resulting in the Latin War. This Latin League of Cities and Villages, being Latins, were more closely related to the Romans than the Etruscans, Samnites, or others from the Italian peninsula. So while the odds were always in Rome's favor, the Latin League fought back viciously, according to Livy. By 338 BCE though, Rome had thoroughly defeated the Latins, and disbanded the Latin League. Some cities under Roman rule, who sided with the Latins, were stripped of their right to trade and hold council, while others were given citizenship without the vote. They had all the duties of a citizen, such as military service, but they were not able to participate in elections. So, after encroaching a bit more to the south after the Samnite War, and subduing the other Latin cities, Rome was relatively stable for over a decade. But by 326 BCE, the Romans and Samnites were out for each other again. This second, or Great Samnite War, would last for 22 years. Tensions had already been high for years prior to the fighting, but the Romans once again broke a treaty, crossing the Liri River and establishing a colony at Fragella. After raids by the Samnites, the Romans had their excuse to go to war. Their main goal, after all, was to have central Italy for themselves. Over the two decades of war, there were various short-term truces, and small battles that went both ways, but the most famous of these, was the Battle of Cordine Forks, in 321 BCE. Despite the name, this was no battle. The Samnites had sent soldiers disguised as mere shepherds towards the Roman camps. They spread rumors that the Samnites were about to attack the city of Capua, so the Roman army marched there with haste and right into an ambush. Surrounded, the Romans knew they had to surrender. Their fate was in the Samnites' hands. It's possible the war could have ended here, with the Samnite general's father suggesting to either let the Romans go, perhaps forging an alliance, or to have them all killed, ending the Roman threat for the foreseeable future. But the Samnites opted to go with the middle way. They let the Romans go, but not until they were mocked by passing under the yoke, a symbol of humiliation in Italy. So not only was the army still alive, they wanted payback more than ever. 
and they had a five-year truce to work with. They spent this time overhauling their entire military. The phalanx formation they had been using, taken from the Etruscans and Greeks, wasn't suitable for fighting the Samnites on their mountainous terrain. They instead took elements of the Samnites' own military, and arranged their army in the Manipula Legion. Instead of large masses of men, like the phalanx, the maniple was described as being like a phalanx, but with joints. Each unit consisted of 120 men, and were deployed in three lines. The first was the Hastati. They were the youngest, and most intrepid and daring soldiers. They originally used the pilum, but over time, would use the gladius, a short sword, as their primary weapon. Behind them, were the principes. They were often much wealthier soldiers than the Hastati, and older and more experienced. The Trieri, the oldest veterans, served behind the principes. They used long pikes, instead of throwing javelins, and would be the most heavily armored. Usually the Romans won most battles before the Trieri needed to even be used. If they did have to fight, it was often as a last resort. The consul, Appius Claudius Caecus, undertook a building project to create a road for faster travel for this improved army. The road, from Rome, down to Beneventum in Campania, was later named the Appian Way. Once the truce expired, the Romans got the upper hand on the Samnites, and even undertook military campaigns against the Etruscans and Umbrians. After capturing Bovianum, a major Samnite city, a peace treaty was signed, ending the war. The Romans now had more of a hold on central Italy, but the Samnites had one last gasp in them. This time, they would assemble Roman enemies against it, a desperate coalition to push back Roman dominion, once and for all. In 298 BCE, the Romans got word of these alliances. One was to the Etruscans, the oldest of these peoples, predating any of the Italic speakers. One to the Umbrians, closely related to the Samnites, and lived over the Apennine Mountains. And one alliance with the Senone to the north. The Senone were the ancient tribe of Gauls who had settled in northern Italy, and sacked Rome under their leader Brennus a century earlier. After three years of fighting, the decisive moment was in 295 BCE, at the Battle of Sentinum, in Umbria. The Etruscans and Umbrians were supposed to circle around and attack the Roman camp from behind, while the Gauls and Samnites held them in battle. This plan failed, as the Romans sent raiders to Etruscan and Umbrian lands, forcing their respective armies to go back and protect their home. This meant the Romans only faced the combined might of mainly Gauls and Samnites, the two enemies Rome felt the most vengeance towards. This was still a fairly even fight, at around 40,000 troops on both sides. The battle began badly for the Romans, as their cavalry broke ranks at the Gaulish chariot charge, and a Roman consul sacrificed himself to counter the Senone. But his selfless act and devotional, electrified his troops and they fought back harder than ever. Rome's other consul survived, and they succeeded in breaking the Samnite and Gaulish lines, and routed the enemy. Livy alludes that if the Etruscans and Umbrians had also been at the Battle of Sentinum, the Romans would have been handily defeated. The coalition was crushed, but for years to come, there would be more minor fights and raids, until 290 BCE, when the Romans dictated a peace treaty on their terms. Many of the cities they took over, received citizenship without the vote. Rome would also send out military garrisons, and colonize many areas as well. Through these approximately 50 years, contending with three Samnite wars, and the Latin War, Rome became more hardened for conflict. They reorganized their military, and became more experienced. The Romans had a firm grasp on central Italy at last, but the more they expanded, the closer they got, to danger. The Etruscans still lay to the north, but they were significantly weakened. The real danger, was to the south. The colonies of Magna Graecia now stood in Rome's path. But could this small republic stand a chance against the magnificent and storied Hellenic world? While Rome was still a tiny speck of huts on the map, Greece was already colonizing the Mediterranean during its archaic period. 
While Rome was at the mercy of a band of Gauls, Greece had already fought, and repelled, the greatest empire on earth, a whole century earlier. And at the same time Rome was fighting an exhausting battle with Samnite mountain folk, the Greeks and Macedonians had taken over Egypt and Asia, and fought legendary wars, on the grandest of scales. This epilogue puts a close to this chapter, but in the next, we find out how Rome inserted itself as one of the big players, on the world stage. Next chapter, Rome faces a new challenge. Greeks and Carthaginians, beware. Next chapter will be, The Rise of Rome.